God hasn't called you to produce stress for others. He's called you to reduce stress in others. This is the third message in the series, How to Stay Sane in a Crazy World, Five Practices for Spiritual and Emotional Health. The message is entitled, Practice Release Part Two. Here is Pastor Dale O'Shields. Would you join me in welcoming our Frederick campus this morning? Good morning to all the folks in Frederick. So great to be together today in the study of God's Word. We are continuing a series of messages I started actually two weekends ago. This is the third message in the series entitled, How to Stay Sane in a Crazy World. How to Stay Sane in a Crazy World. As I mentioned to you just a couple of weekends ago, this was a bit of a departure from what I'd planned on preaching on for this month, but I felt very clearly directed by God to take this time and this topic together at this season and to take a look at how do you and I navigate the world that we're in right now. Obviously, our world is a very crazy place. As we think about the world, uh, crisis points around us. We think about the Middle East and all the turmoil that's there. We think about issues in Ukraine and literally globally all around the world. We actually are just perhaps steps away from the potential of major conflict in our world. We see it here at home, all the different kind of strife that we see even in our own nation. We see it actually at the economic level, people who are battling with economic pressures during this time and inflation and those kind of things. It is truly a crazy world that we live in. Not only is it crazy in terms of just circumstantially issues that we are contending with as people, as, as, as a group of citizens together in our nation and citizens of this world, but also there's another kind of craziness that's going on in our society today. It's the craziness of morality, or perhaps I should say a lack thereof. There was a particular time in our nation when we at least acknowledged, whether we acted on it or not, we at least acknowledged the value of things like the Ten Commandments and the value of the Bible and the value of things that were right and things that were wrong, but sequentially over time, there's been an erosion of that sense of morality and a mood beyond just morality or an awareness of morality to great immorality. And now I believe we actually are on the precipice, if we're not already there, of something I would term as a morality. There's almost no morality at all. That you can basically do whatever you want to do as long as you don't feel like you're hurting anybody else with it. And you can define for yourself what is right and what is wrong. There is no absolute authoritative source or standard of, of morality or truth. And so because of that, we live at our own level. We live based upon what we want to do with our own lives. No standards to measure by. And that creates a crazy world, a lack of morals in our culture. Now, we could stand here all day and curse the negativity of the culture in which we live in, but the Bible teaches us that we're not to be surprised when these things happen. In fact, I would submit to you today that I believe these things that we're seeing are nothing more than a sign of the last days. The Apostle Paul made clear to Timothy in a very clear passage of Scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. He says, but mark this, pay attention to this, there will be, notice this, terrible times when? In the last days. Terrible times in the last days. Now, to understand terrible times, we must first of all define what are the last days. Well, the last days started when Jesus rose from the grave and ascended back to heaven the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church at the day of Pentecost, and that began what we know to be the last days. That started the clock ticking, the, the countdown clock, if you will, until Jesus comes back again. And so in that regard, we are living in the last days, but the further along in that time frame that we go, we're living in the last of the last days, and then the last of the last of the last days, and then there will come the time when Jesus Christ will come back again. And Paul says to Timothy and to us as well, mark this, be aware of this, don't let this take you by surprise. There will be terrible times. One translation uses the word perilous times. The actual Greek word that we find here is a word that means a violent set of times, fierce, wild, difficult, or other words that are used, hard to bear, distressing. Actually, the Greek word that's used here is often used to describe demoniacs, people who are demonized. And I think that we could 
uh, oftentimes, as we look at our world, see a world that is being demonized, effect, affected by things that go beyond just standard evil to demonically inspired evil. But there's no question, no question in my mind, nor I believe from a scriptural standpoint, that the return of Jesus obviously is closer than it's ever been before. He is coming back. We do not know when Jesus is coming back. He could come back today. He may come back tomorrow. He may come back a thousand years from now. We don't know for sure, but we know one thing for sure. He is indeed coming back. And his delay in coming back is for one primary reason. He doesn't want any to perish, but he wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the only thing that is holding him, holding the Father back from sending him to us is the fact that he wants to give every person possible an opportunity to come to faith in Christ. But he is coming back. I want you to notice with me, again, some of Paul's words found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. They're going to be on the screen for you as I read them today. And let's take a look at what Paul says about these days, these last days. Brothers and sisters, that's you and me as Christians, We do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope as we don't want you to be worried about Christians who've died and gone on to their reward. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's words, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the time or until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Please notice that statement. It's not a statement of might. It's a statement of will. The Lord will come come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangels, and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Paul says there will be a time when Jesus Christ will come back again. The dead in Christ will rise. Those who are living when he comes will be caught up in the air together with him for all eternity. Jesus is coming back again. And the craziness of our world points to the fact that we're gaining ground ever so closely to his second coming. Now, what does this look like when Jesus returns? I'm going to do something today that I think you'll find helpful. I'm going to present to you Uh, And we're going to get into the concept of release today here in just a few moments. It will help us to understand how we are to respond to these terrible times. But I want to give you a little bit of an understanding of how the second coming of Jesus could happen. I'm going to give you three options as theologians have studied this. There are various different schools of thought regarding how Jesus could return, what it might look like in terms of the last days. But I thought I would give you at least three ways of looking at it. There are more than three, but these are the three that uh, tend to gain more more, uh, momentum among theologians and Bible scholars. Here's the first one. I've just identified them as three options of Jesus' return. First of all is the first advent of Jesus. He came, that's Christmas, when he's born, engages in his earthly ministry. He dies on the cross. He's risen from the grave, and then he ascends back to God the Father. He was lifted up from the Mount of Olives and went back to heaven. Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. Okay, Right now, he's alive. And he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, waiting for the moment when the Father will send him back. At that time, there was a defeat of Satan. We obviously realize that from the book of Colossians, chapters 1 and 2, there was a defeat of darkness by what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. And this is the season of time that we're living in. This We might call it the the present, the ongoing present. And we're living in this sequence of time when the gospel is being preached and the kingdom of God is being advanced. And we're steadily moving toward a very critical time in history. It's what I would call or what we might refer to as right before the final judgment, a significant time of tribulation and evil. Some refer to this as the great tribulation. But certainly there'll be an outbreak we, we, we've not seen anything yet compared to this sequence of tribulation. 
or talking about the Antichrist and the battle of Armageddon and those kind of things as the book of Revelation refers to. And there'll be this moment, this very short season of time where Satan is loosed again and there's this great battle, these great intense forces come together in a great conflict. And obviously then Jesus comes back again He resurrects those who are dead in Christ. We who are still alive at that moment will be caught up, and then that will issue in this general resurrection of all dead and the final judgment where the books will be opened. The critical book that will be opened is called the Book of Life. And the Book of Life will represent those whose names have been recorded in that book because they've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. And those whose names are found in the book will go to their eternal reward. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Those whose names are not found in the book of life will then experience eternal separation from God. But there's this moment that ushers us into eternity. That's one way to look at the second coming of Jesus. Let me give you a second way. Some believe that the second coming of Jesus will happen similarly similarly to this. Obviously, his first coming, what we don't have on the board here is the moment of his death and his resurrection, his ascension. But now we're living in this moment called the present again, the sequence of time, whatever that time period is, moving again toward what some theologians believe to be a great tribulation that precedes the second coming of Jesus of seven years. During this seven-year period of time, again, we'll see potentially the rise of an antichrist figure who will go to war against those who know Christ. There'll be this intense tribulation and persecution, the battle of Armageddon, and then obviously the second coming of Jesus, and then Jesus coming to reign on the earth for a thousand years, seated on the throne of his kingdom in Jerusalem, as some teach ruling from there for a thousand years. Then at the end of that thousand years, a loosing point of evil, again, finding another season of tribulation and evil that ushers in the final judgment. And then out of that final judgment of the opening of the books, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Those who know Christ will be ushered in to the new heaven and the new earth. And those who don't know him will then be separated as the sheep are from the goats at that moment. And then we'll all face our eternity either with God or eternally separated from God. That's the second option of how the second coming of Jesus could happen. Let me give you a third option. It's similar to the second, but there's a slight variation in it. Why am I doing this? Because I just want you to be aware because there's a common theme in it all that I'll point out in just a moment. Again, we have Jesus' first coming. We have his death and resurrection, his ascension. Then we have what these theologians would would refer to as the church age. That's the age that we're in right now. The preaching of the gospel, the church age is occurring that will lead up to a time in history when there'll be this moment, this monumental moment called the rapture. Anyone ever heard of the rapture before? Anyone read the Left Behind series? If you've read the Left Behind series, then you're aware of these, this, this terminology. And so it's that moment when there's this raising of those who have died in Christ, and then there's the separation of those catching in the air, those who are still living, and there's this moment of rapture when we're taken away with Jesus, then this issues, issues in another year, uh, seven years of tribulation, and then we, those who've been caught up in the rapture, will come back with Jesus at the second coming where he establishes his kingdom on earth for a thousand years, again, most likely ruling from his throne in Jerusalem there at that moment, reigning for a thousand years, us reigning who've gone with him, reigning with him over that period of time as the world continues at some level, then a final moment when we, again, we have the nations revolting against him, tribulation happening, great war that transpires, people fighting against God, and the final judgment that then will occur as happens in all three of these designs. And then obviously with the opening of the books, those who now find their names in the book will go to eternal reward with Jesus. And those whose names are not recorded in the book of life separated as the sheep from the goats. And of course, the sheep spending the rest of eternity in a new heaven and a new earth with Christ and as a part of his kingdom forever and forever and forever. Why do I give you these three designs? Because there are some similarities in all three of these. The primary similarity is no matter what you believe about how it's going to happen, it's going to happen. 
I don't know what background you've come from in terms of what you believe about how it's going to happen. And a lot of times we get all frustrated because somebody doesn't believe it's going to happen exactly how we believe it's going to happen. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter because nobody really knows for sure how it's going to happen. But I am here to tell you today that it is going to happen. And when it happens, it is final. And what we also see similarly in all three of these patterns is something called tribulation. Everybody say tribulation. tribulation. Whether it's an ongoing tribulation that is culminated in a season of intense tribulation or there's a seven-year period of tribulation, it really doesn't matter. What matters is do you have faith to get you through any tribulation in your life? Because, see, our faith is not a faith that is designed to get us out of here. I'm not just waiting to escape from earth. God called me and called you here on earth in the midst of darkness to be a light in the midst of darkness. And if you're stressed out by tribulation, you'll never be able to shine as the light God wants you to be. And so you and I need a faith, not just that I'm going to finally get out of here, but a faith that says it will my faith will get me through whatever I may face in the days to come. And there is a faith that God wants to establish in you and me that gives us that kind of confidence and that kind of assurance. So I'm going to talk to you today about how do you deal with tribulation? How do you deal with the stress of tribulation, whatever it looks like in your life? Actually, another word I'm going to use is how to deal with distress in your life and handle it the right way through learning Again, the word that we're going to talk about today is the same one we talked about last week by learning how to release. Would you say that word with me again? Release. The first weekend I talked about reverence. How do you stay sane in a, in a crazy world? You have to have reverence for God, reverence for His word, reverence for His paths, patterns of rhythm in your life. Last weekend we talked about the importance of release at one level. Today we're talking about the second aspect of that. Three points I want to share with you today. Here we go. Number one, you and I need to understand the causes and the symptoms of distress in our life. This is a key word. This is the word we're talking about today. You might recall that last weekend I used a graph. And the graph that I used last weekend had two axis points on it. And one is your performance, your ability to do well at something. The other was your stress level. And we talked about the fact that there's a bell-shaped curve associated with this, the idea being that there's a certain level of stress in your life that will bring you to optimum performance. You need a certain amount of stress in your life to do well. Everybody does. You don't do well without some level of stress. And psychologists refer to this side of the equation as eustress, E-U, good stress. So there's this side of the equation where as your stress increases, your performance increases till you get to an optimal level of performance. All of us can practically understand this. Have you ever been given an assignment that had a timeline to it? And the timeline itself stressed you, but it brought out your performance. You did what you didn't think you could do because you had to get it done at a certain time and you were stressed out by it, but the stress associated with it brought something out of you that you never would have done had it not been for the stress or the pressure that was placed upon you. So you rose to the occasion. So there's a good stress, but there's also a moment when stress increases in your life to such a degree that it has a deleterious effect upon you. It begins to have a counterproductive effect upon you. And instead of your performance going up, what happens? Your performance goes down. So the higher your stress goes, the less capable you become. One side, the higher your stress comes, the more capable you are. You get to the other side at a particular point in this journey that caps off in your life and you begin to drop off your performance. And psychologists refer to this kind of stress as distress. So there's good stress and there's bad stress. Last weekend, I talked about how to handle the good stress. That we need to recognize that 
We need, to, we need to, I'll say it this way, we need to release our expectation that life should always be perfect. Release our expectation that everything should always go well because God wants to put some pressure on your life so that you can grow. If you never have any pressure on your life, you'll never grow. And so we talked about the benefits of this and how God uses that part of our life. But today, I want to talk to you about this other side of the equation. How do you know when you've hit this point and you're starting to go downhill? Let me give you a few symptoms of distress in your life. These are not on your notes, but you may find it helpful to jot some of these down. How do you know when you're getting distressed? How do you know when you've hit this point and now stress is beginning to work in a negative way in your life? Well, first of all, you start feeling very overwhelmed. You feel helpless. You feel hopeless in your life. You begin to experience what I would call debilitating worry and anxiety. Not just regular kind of worry and anxiety. It's debilitating. It's it's keeping you from functioning well. Fear may start taking over your life and dictate the decisions you're making. You begin to experience debilitating guilt and shame. You can't shake your sense of failure. You can't shake your sense of feeling worthless at some level in your life. Then you begin to suffer with decision making. You have a hard time making decisions. That's some of you all the time, right? But it gets to the point where you, you, just, you, you struggle. I don't know what to do. What should I do here? You're struggling with the capacity to think clearly and to, to, to move forward with positive activity. And then you will find yourself extremely fatigued in life and irritable and angry. It just seems as though all the time there's this fatigue and irritation and anger that you're dealing with. Not just regular irritation, but I'm talking about debilitating extreme Fatigue and irritability and anger, it's seething inside of you all the time. What's that telling you? It's telling you you're now on this side of the equation. You're now being distressed. It's normal to get angry and irritated from time to time, but it's not normal to live there. Okay. And then oftentimes for some people, you begin to depend on substances. You begin to use some kind of substance to soften the distress that you're feeling in your life. For some, that might be alcohol. And so alcohol begin, begins to be your go-to. I'm feeling stressed out. You may not even necessarily think this way, but you begin to drink more than you would normally drink, or you begin to drink for the first time in your life. Or you begin to utilize some other substance. I'm not talking about medication that's been prescribed for you by your doctor. I'm talking about something that's outside of the realm of what would be good for you. And so you begin that pattern in your life because you're trying to deal with your distress, your, your bad stress in your life. And that's a symptom of it. Sometimes that substance can actually be food. Some people depend upon food, and some people depend upon toxic relationships. There are all kinds of things that we go to to try to soften distress. And then there's usually some level of withdrawal and isolation. When you get over here, you start pulling back into your own world and withdrawing and isolating yourself from other people, especially people that really care about you. And you begin to find yourself pulling away, and people say, it's hard to reach you, and it's hard to connect with you now. You may be around, but not really around, because stress is working on your social skills, your social interaction. It's been said that under stress, we regress. Or I'll say it this way, under distress, we regress. We, we go back to old, bad patterns in our life. Now, to make you feel a little bit better today, everyone gets distressed at times. Just breathe for a moment. It's okay. okay. Everybody gets distressed at times. I've gotten distressed at times. All the great men and women of the Bible get distressed. I've gotten distressed distressed at times. We could talk about Job. Job had moments of distress. David, the king of Israel, had moments when he was greatly distressed. And Elijah, we talked about him a few weeks ago. He had his moment when Ahab and Jezebel were trying to kill him. And he had his moment of distress in his life. And we can talk about even the Apostle Paul where there are times that he talks about being distressed in his life. So it's normal to find yourself at this particular place going downhill. That might be you today. And so what this does is this makes you crazy in a crazy world. Right? Are you with me? Okay. So what's the title of our, our series? How to Stay Sane in a Crazy World. So when you hit this point of being distressed, then you begin to be a part of the craziness of the world around you, and you bring it into your world, your environment, and your relationships. And I'm going to talk to you about the things that cause this to happen. 
Everybody listening to me today? It was a teaching. What, what causes you to get to this point in your life? What creates the set of circumstances that result in us falling into this pattern of distress? And we all do it. I'm going to give you a few things that these are going to be on, on the screen. They'll also be in your notes, I believe, as well. At least your extended notes that you find on our website. The first thing that happens or causes it is a negative restricting mindset. Negativity. As soon as you start thinking negatively, negative thinking will always pull you downhill. It never pulls you uphill. It always pulls you down. And that's why it's called negative, okay? And so we get into these negative mindsets. I'm not talking about a negative thought. I'm talking about a negative pattern of thought. One thought produces another negative thought. And before long, you're thinking, oh, this is bad. And this is going to be worse. And what about this? If this happens before long, all these negative what if catastrophic things begin to happen in your mind. And it begins to have a, a restricting effect upon you. The second thing that oftentimes creates distress in our lives, in our lives are unresolved trauma in your life. Hurts and pains that you haven't dealt with, especially of, a, of an emotional nature. And so you're carrying these things around inside of you. You haven't resolved them. And so they continue to plague you and distress you, uh, even at the most uh, inopportune times. The way I like to describe it is this way. Have you ever been in a, in a swimming pool or a lake or a pond or something with a, with a beach ball and try to hold it underwater? Ever had to do that before? Okay. What happens when you try to hold a, a beach ball underwater? What is, or any kind of ball that's filled with air underwater, what happens? It's always, what's the pressure? It's always trying to push up, right? Okay? And so, you, and so to keep it underwater, you're using energy to do what? Keep it down. I want you to think about trauma in your life, hurts and pains and places of relationship failure or whatever it might be, traumas in your life. I want you to think of it as a, as a beach ball. And what we oftentimes do is we take those things in our life and we try to suppress them. We push them down, okay? And they're, they're under the surface, but they're not gone. Are you with me? Okay. They're under the surface, so you can walk around. Hi, how are you today? I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. You just can't see my beach ball. Okay. Right? So you can go around and pretend like you're normal. And you may not even be aware. Some people have been pushing a beach ball down so long they forgot it was there. Because their whole life, what have they been doing? Using this energy to try to keep their trauma under surface. Okay. And then what happens when you have additional things that occur in your life or certain pressures that happen in your life, that beach ball boom, pops up. Okay. It's, oh, I got to get it back down again. Okay. Well, the thing that God wants to do in your life is He wants to heal your trauma. Amen? Because the healing of the trauma, then you don't, you don't spend the rest of your life using energy to try to keep it down. Our God is the healer of broken hearts. Amen? That's who He is, okay? He's the restorer of souls in us. And so many times it's unresolved trauma that's creating the distress that we're experiencing in our life. Sometimes it's... it's a threat that you feel, an emotional threat that you might feel, might even be a physical threat, but it creates a distressful moment for you. It could be looming personal concerns or cares or worries. Something's really big and it's looming over your life. You feel, I'm going to lose my job or what am I going to do with that bill? It begins to worry and trouble you and it looms big and heavy over you. Sometimes it's the feeling of or the reality of a loss of control or the inability to control things around you. It seems like life is getting out of control or some situation is getting out of control. And so you can't control it any longer. You're trying, but it's creating distress for you. This happens for many, many people. It's called unresolved loss in your life. You've lost a loved one. You've lost a relationship. You've lost something of value in your life, and you haven't worked through the grief of it because grief is natural to loss. It's important to grieve when you've lost something, but it's also important not to live in grief for the rest of your life. Amen? Okay. That grief is something you walk through. You realize this is what I've lost, but now this is what I have left in my life. But unresolved loss can create opportunities for distress. Also, overexposure to negativity can cause distress in your life. I'm going to write one word on the board that perhaps is causing distress in your life. Are you ready for it? Don't raise your hand right now. Do we have any news junkies in the room? Okay. 
There was a time in our, in our culture where you might get a little bit of news in the morning and you, then you would watch the evening news at night. And there was usually three broadcast channels that would give you the evening news at night. And that's basically all the news that you got. But now we have 24-7 news cycles. And everything's a crisis. Okay. Breaking news! Okay. And you're like, okay, I better watch that. It's breaking news. And you're like, well, that wasn't really breaking news. It was just got my attention. And so everything's breaking news. So everything's a crisis! So I better stay in touch because the world may fall apart if I don't pay attention to the news every moment of every day. And what I found out in my own life is that that distresses me. How about you? Amen? My wife and I made a commitment. We just, we watch the news very sparingly now. Very sparingly. Why? Because I'm tired of throwing stuff at the television, okay? Are you with me today? That's a joke, by the way, just so you know, okay? That's a joke, okay? But it distresses us because we're getting all this negativity. And there are other ways that we, if you get maybe a negative people in your life, whatever it might be, but there's this overexposure to negativity it causes distress, haunting guilt and shame over your personal disappointments or failures. It just haunts you. You can't get away from the mistakes that you've made. And it just beats you down and, and just uh, eats you up on the inside. Anytime that you feel like that you're deeply disappointed with some hope you had or an expectation you had in your life, and you can't get away, oh, I, I wanted that to happen and it didn't happen or it didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen in my life and you have this disappointment. The Bible says that deferred gratification creates a despair in your life. It creates distress in your life. Then there's this atmosphere that we all live in of persistent uncertainty. I don't know what's going to happen. What do you think is going to happen? What's going to happen in the Middle East? I don't know. What do you think is going to happen in the Middle East? Before long, you begin to think about all the different scenarios of what could happen and the uncertainty of the world around us. We live in a very uncertain world. So when we focus on that, it creates distress for us. And the last one I will mention here, these are all causes, is the absence of a meaningful personal faith in your life. When your faith is under attack, it will be very distressful for you. What I want to say to you at this point, at this first point of the message, is distress is real. Say it with me. Distress is real. It's very real. It was real for Job. It was real for David. It was real for Elijah. It was real for Paul. It's real for you and me as well. Distress is not something that is imaginary. There's a point on the curve of your life where there's so much stress that it moves you beyond good stress to bad stress in your life. Here's the second lesson for us today. You and I need to practice the process of release. I'm going to circle three words here. Practice, process, release. What I want you to see is that release is the objective. And I'm going to define that for you in a moment. So releasing stress is the effect. Releasing distress is the objective. That's what we want to do. Because if you're distressed, you need to release the distress so that it no longer is troubling you in the same way. Now, to do that, you've got to what? Practice a process. Practice means you're not going to always get it right, okay? Process means that it doesn't just happen one time. It's something that you do over and over again, that you get better at over time. Hopefully, that you learn to handle things in a more effective way because of the practicing of the process, I really wish that we had, uh, we had a, 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 a vaccine for distress. Wouldn't that be awesome, okay? Wouldn't that be amazing? We just line everybody up, roll your sleeve up. We're going to vaccinate you for distress. You'll never have it again in your entire life. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It'd be great. But it doesn't exist. And so you have to learn how to deal with this stuff. And we have to learn how to stay sane in what kind of world? in a crazy world. So we've got to learn to release the stuff because there's tribulation all around us and it's not going to get better, is it? What did Paul say? Mark this. In the last days, there will be beautiful, wonderful, perfect times. No. He says, in the last days, there will be perilous times. So just get used to it. It's a reality. So how do we live in these days? I want to share with you some steps in the process for you and I to handle it well. How do we practice the process of release? Here we go. Number one, you need to understand the consequences of extended stress in your life. Why? Because this motivates you to do something about it. 
You'll never do anything about anything unless you understand what effect is having on your life, the consequences. You know that stress, distress has consequences in your life? It lowers your immunity. It affects you psychologically. It affects the relationships. It affects you spiritually as well. Look at what Jesus said in Mark chapter 4 as he's describing the working of his word. He's talking about a sower that goes out and sows seed, some by a path, some by rocky ground. Then he comes to this and describes the sowing of his word in the hearts and lives of people and says, still others like seed, that's the word of God sown among thorns, hear the word. They hear the word of God, but But the worries of this life, they hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in, and what happens? Choke the word. Would you call that a consequence? The word is choked because of what? One aspect of it is the worries of life, the distresses that we find ourselves in, so we have to take stress seriously. You have to take it seriously. Then the second thing that's necessary, how do you practice the process of release? Identify and acknowledge your distress. Know where you are on the symptoms that I described a few moments ago. Recognize those in your life. Identify them. Realize when you're there. Realize when you've peaked and now you're at a very distressed place in your life. Use those symptoms. As the psalmist said in Psalm 31, be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in, what, I, what am, I, am I in? Distress, my eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. David realized where he was, and he asked God for help. He wasn't hiding his distress. He was acknowledging his distress. The next several that I want to give you, let me just give you a little caveat before I give you the next several of these. They're going to sound very simple. And they're going to sound like pat answers, but they're not. They're very real, meaningful things that you and I need to do. So don't just say, oh, I know that one. No, you need to know these, okay? The next one is this. You've got to learn to pray, okay? You've got to pray, okay? More and more as you grow in your faith in Christ, as you go through the tough times, you don't need to pray less. You need to pray more, okay? When you see all these things happening in the world around you, what what should you do? Worry or pray. Our response as believers is to, is to pray. When you feel distressed, what are, what are you to do? You are to pray. Not, not only do I acknowledge my reality, but I bring it to God. Take a look at what he says here, and the psalmist does in Psalm 77, verse 2. When I was in distress... I sought the Lord at night. I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. So so, uh, David says, when I was in distress, I went after God. I sought him. Even through the night seasons, I prayed like I'd never prayed before. This passage is one you know well. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Living Bible, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs, and don't forget to thank Him for His answers. If you do this, what? If you do what? Pray and thank If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. So it's very important that we pray. Now, when we pray, what else do we do? What is prayer all about? It's when we give God our concerns. See, prayer is not just talking about your concerns. Prayer is giving your concerns to God, actually giving them to Him. Are you saying, Pastor, that we can actually do that? Well, it's not my word. Let's see what the Bible says. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Actually, one translation actually renders it this way. Cast all your cares on him. Everything that's distressing you, what are you and I to do with it? Notice the word cast is to throw off of ourselves onto another. If I said, cast me that ball, if you had a ball in your hand, and I said, cast me that ball, what would it mean? 
It would mean that you would throw the ball to me, right? You would no longer have it in your hands. You would throw it to me. If I walked along beside you and you had a heavy weight that you were carrying and I say, cast your weight on me, you would put your weight over on me and I would carry it for you. This is what it means with God. Cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. What does he do for you and his care for you? Exodus 14, 14 tells us that the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Aren't you glad that when you give things to God, He takes up your cause and He fights for you? Okay. He fights for you. How many of you today can say, you can look back, seriously, I want us to take this as a moment of thanksgiving and praise. You can look back on your life at some point and you know God fought a battle for you somewhere along the line. Come on, let's give Him some praise right now. You know He fought a battle for you. Okay. You don't, you're not just imagining that He fought. You know God fought a battle for you. And he does what he did in the past, he'll do today. Here's the next thing that's necessary. Trust. Trust him. Now that you've cast it over on him, knowing you'll fight the battle for you, you prayed about it, then you trust him with it. As the psalmist says in Psalm 56, verse 3, when I am afraid, when I'm distressed, what do I do? I put my trust, my reliance, is another word here, my confidence in or on you. I'm trusting you to handle this. And then the next thing that's necessary is to focus on God's good promises. This is, this is extremely important. You're going to focus on something in your life always. You're always focusing on something. You're focusing on your problems. You're focusing on yourself. You're focusing on whatever it might be. We always focus on something. Okay? You cannot not focus. Right now, you're either focused on me and the message, or you're focused on lunch when you get out of here, <laughs> or you're focused on something is going to happen this week, but you can't, you know, we like to think that we can multitask. We don't really multitask very well. Actually, we do best when we're focused, right? Okay. And so what will get you through your distressful moments is to focus on the good promises of God. Look at this. My comfort... In my suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. Now, let me just quickly add for some of you, you might say, I don't, I don't know the promises of God. Well, you can learn them. There are many, many great resources. You can just search the concept of the promises of God. There are many great books that you can buy that are actually promise books. I'm not trying to sell books today, but I'll give you two references of what we have here. A couple of years, a few years back, I did a book called Unleash. It's filled with the promises of God, 25 affirmations to release your potential. This is about very important promises from God. You might recall a few years ago, I did this little book called 21 Days to a Better Way of Thinking. It's a journal where you can start focusing in on the promises of God. These are just two resources. There are lots of great resources out there. But if you don't know the promises of God, get busy learning God's promises for your life, whatever resource that you use to do so. Because you need to focus on God's promises. Why? Because they will preserve your life. i got just a few more here. Practice your or engage your praise. David the psalmist made this statement. He says, I will extol or praise the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Here's the thing I want to mention here in this regard. Number one, remember this. Anytime you're distressed, you will not feel like praying and you will not feel like praising. Any, that's one mark that I know that I feel I'm, I'm under stress. That it actually robs from me a desire to or a passion about prayer or praise. Because it puts you under your problem, right? And when you're under your problem... You don't feel like praying and you don't feel like praising. You don't feel like it. So that's the first thing to remember. Here's the second thing to remember. The best thing that you can do when you're under stress is to pray and praise, okay? So it, your feelings are going to be completely opposite of that. But you make the choice like David and says, you know what? I may not feel like it, but I know it's the best thing that I can do in this moment. Here's the next thing that's necessary. Stay active. When you're under, dis under stress, distress, it wants to shut you down, move you into withdrawal mode, isolation mode. 
It's extremely important that you stay active, that you don't pull into yourself, because that will only make it worse. Jesus, one day during his earthly ministry, went to Jerusalem to a place called the Pool of Bethesda. And there were people all around this pool. It was a place of healing. And, uh, and uh, there was one particular man there who had been sick for 38 years. And so he's laying on a mat. He's paralyzed for 38 years. He tried to get in the pool. Nobody would ever get him into the pool of healing. And so he's been disappointed and doesn't expect anything to ever happen in his life. Jesus comes along and he finds a man who is in complete hopelessness, despair, distressed by his hopelessness. And Jesus, out of all the people around the pool that day, found that one man who didn't have any hope anymore. And he went to this one man and he said, Would you like to get well? Would you like for Jesus to speak those words to you today? Would you like to get well? Do you want to get well? Now he said, oh, I'd love to hear that. Well, think about that for a moment. It was designed to create hope in him, but also to challenge him a little bit. Because if he gets well... He's got to get active. He's got to go get a job. Okay. He's got to start doing things that he hadn't done before because he's been laying on that pallet for 38 years, and so he's going to have to get active. And I want you to notice what Jesus says to the man as soon as he says that he wanted to be healed. Notice Jesus' words. Jesus said to him, what? Let's just stop right there. Here's a distressed man, and what does Jesus say? Get up! Pick up your mat and walk. Let me tell you what stress will do in your life. It will make you go in your bedroom, pull the sheet over your head, turn all the lights out, close all the blinds and the windows and say, I'm just going to stay here. I'm not getting up. Right? And Jesus says, if you want to move forward into healing, at some point you've got to get up and pick up your mat and walk. You've got to stay active. Don't let stress and distress pull you into inactivity in your life. And the last one I'll mention here is this one, refuse to take back whatever you've given to God. If you gave it to him, don't dare take it back. Give it to him. Practice release. One final point today. Here's the third point. I'm going to cover this quickly. Be a distress reducer, not a distress producer. Producer. This is where it moves beyond you to other people. Some people seem to have just a knack to create stress. You ever noticed that before? I was like, they should change their name. Hi, my name is Stress. Okay. Okay. Because they walk into a room and drama comes in with them. Okay. And stress comes in with them. And agitation comes. And they just like, they fly in. And it's like a tornado that happens. And they walk back out. And everybody's left with, what just happened here? Oh, that was Joe. He just came through the room there. Okay. Or that was whoever. Okay. And here's the thing I want you to see. If you're a stress producer, actually it's counterproductive for you. Because where you create stress, you feed stress in your own life. Okay. See, if you create stress all around you, what's, what's coming back at you? I promise you, if I go home today and create stress with my wife, it's coming back. <laughs> it's coming back. Okay. Are you with me today? Okay. So we think that we can kind of dump it on other people, but actually when you're trying to sort of dump it on other people, what actually is happening is it's going to come back at you at some level. And so you create these environments. And so what the Bible teaches us is that we need to learn how to be stress reducers, not stress producers. Very vital for us to realize this. Because the more you reduce stress in the world around you, the less stress will be in your life. That's just a selfish benefit for it. It's also beneficial for the other people in your world. See, God doesn't need you. Some people think, well, that person needs some stress in their life, and God sent me as a gift to stress them. <laughs> because God, my husband really needs God, and he needs to get uh, a right relationship with God, and maybe if I stress him enough, he'll come to enough pain that he'll seek God, okay? Or vice versa. You can just fill out the, the blanks any way you want to, that you view yourself as being the the person that is supposed to create the pain for other people so that you can help them, okay? 
Let me tell you something. Please remember, God doesn't need you to do that. Okay? If somebody needs pain in their life, God knows how to give them the pain they need. You don't have to do it. In fact, God says, I'm not calling you to do that. I'm actually calling you to do something different. I'm calling you to go around and just reduce as much stress as you can. Take as much stress out of this world as possible. You say, is that in the Bible? I'm so glad you asked that question. I'm so glad you asked that question. A generous person will prosper. And whoever refreshes others, what will happen to them? They will be refreshed. Isn't that a beautiful passage, a beautiful verse? I'm not done yet. Almost, but not yet. Paul writes to Philemon, the first chapter, the only chapter in that book, actually, verse 7. He says, your love... Philemon, talking to this gentleman, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have what? Refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Wouldn't you like it if your name ended up in the Bible for something good you did instead of something bad you did? Okay. This man's name ended up in the Bible and a book was dedicated to him because of what? Because he was a refresher. He was a refresher. Galatians 6, 2 carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Last verse and we're done. Read it with me if you will today. Can we read it together? Let us, that's you and me, all of us to start again. Let us now we're going to read it again. I, I, sorry, okay, pay attention here, okay. When we say us, I want you to point to yourself, okay. You ready? Let us Therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. So who's the responsibility on? Us, okay? Not you, but us. Why don't we try that again? I think you enjoyed it so much. Let's try it again, right? <laughs> therefore, let, let, us, let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Let's bow our hearts together in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you that you care about distressed people. And that even in the midst of a world that is going through terrible times, that where we can find our rest, our comfort, our peace, our strength in you. So I pray that you would help us to be aware in our own lives of the symptoms of distress when we're finding ourselves being or grappling with it, that you'll help us to practice the principles that we talked about today, and that you'll help us, Lord, to be people who reduce stress in others through the power of your Holy Spirit. Seal this word in our heart today, we pray in Jesus' name. I would like to close today by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Right where you are, just simply bow your head with me, and I'm going to give you a prayer to pray, and you can simply speak this prayer out, whisper this prayer out, and from the sincerity of your heart, call upon God, and I promise you that He will hear and answer you. So let's pray together. Start by simply whispering the name Jesus. Let there come uh, from your heart just the declaration of His name. Say, Jesus... I know that, that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short with you. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's Son. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive today. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start in you. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you with a promise from God's word that says that when we call upon God's name, we call upon the Son of God, there is salvation that comes to our lives. He changes us from the inside out, and you become a new creation. All things pass away, all things become new. And that's exactly what has happened to you today. 
your next step really is to make sure that you get into a good Bible-believing church. And you begin to study God's Word, get God's Word in you, and to make sure that you get a copy of the Bible if you don't have one and begin to read it. Spend some time every day in prayer. And I would encourage you also to check out the resources on our website that will help you to get going in your relationship with Jesus. You can find them at church-redeemer.org. Get those into your hands. Get started in your new life with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.